Well, good morning, CLF. Welcome to our online service today. Moms, we love you. We celebrate you. Happy Mother's Day. And you know what? If you're joining us maybe for the first time, we are so honored that you chose to spend Mother's Day with us here at CLF. So maybe you're on Facebook or YouTube or you found us after the fact here, but um, welcome. And uh, today I have a special guest with me, my beautiful, wonderful wife, Kristen. Happy Mother's Day, honey. Thank you. Is this the best Mother's Day you've ever had? You know, this has been pretty awesome, but I'm thinking of a Mother's Day about eight years ago that was definitely memorable. You guys want to hear it? Okay. I'll, I'll tell it. They said yes. Okay. So anyway, I am uh, in bed and I'm overhearing the children in the kitchen talking about how they are making their mother a breakfast in bed. I kind of got excited. This is kind of, you know, interesting, different. Well, anyway, a couple minutes later, uh, I, I look up and my daughter is standing over me, both of my daughters standing over me with a big glass of orange juice yelling, Happy Mother's Day! And that orange juice just went flying all over me, the bed, the floor, and uh, you know, they felt really bad. And I said, oh, it's okay, you know, I'm so excited. This is, this is great. So they ran back to the kitchen. I'm starting to clean, you know, just woke up. Now I'm cleaning orange juice. And uh, I lay back in bed, because I overhear them saying, you know, we have, we have another gift for mom. And uh, they walk in and I open my eyes. And to my surprise, a big bowl of Rice Krispies. My three or four year old daughter is walking in and, and you know, it's all the way to the top of the bowl. And, uh, you know, you know what happened next, of course. The cereal, you know, I'm 10 minutes later, I'm scrubbing Rice Krispies off the carpet. But it was a great, memorable yep. Mother's and Day. And then we all went ahead and went to the kitchen and I made scrambled eggs and bacon. Yep. And we ate at the <laughs> table and didn't get any on the floor. So that was a great Mother's Day. Well, you know what? Um, we just so appreciate you moms. And so here's a quick video and then we'll be right back with some announcements for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, moms, for everything that you do, everything that's seen and so much that is unseen. You are appreciated today. So uh, Pastor Sherry actually has a message that she is going to be bringing to us directed right towards you moms um, today. But before she gets into that, just a couple things that we want to remind you of, I uh, want to touch on. Uh, first of all, thank you so much again, just for your faithfulness and just your continuing to support the ministries here at CLF with your tithes and your offerings. And uh, if you give online, then you know you go to goclf.church. Uh, you can hit the Give tab and give through that. If you have our app, you can use that as well. Um, you can mail in a check. You can drop it off here at the church uh, during business hours as well. And so this last week, there was some announcements that were made uh, actually with our local, our Illinois government. Uh, that you know some changes are, are kind of happening a little bit and we are so excited uh, for the day when we are going to be able to meet together again 
but we know it's going to be kind of incremental you know if you've been following the news and that um, they're cautiously allowing us to move forward with some things so we are just planning and just um, praying about some different ways and things that we can bring um, us together here and there and so stay posted for that there'll be more information on that coming up here in the near future um, but also something that I want to just hit on is you know parents while we're in this time I know for Kristen and I we got we got thrown into like this homeschooling thing where we are now teachers and I am reminded of doing math problems that I didn't really like to do back in fourth grade and I'm having to remember how in the world did I do that and it's been kind of fun it's been a good refresher um, but you know what even though um, things are different the one thing that has remained the same is that as parents our number one ministry and responsibility is at home you know in Ephesians actually it talks about pastors and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and how Jesus gave those to the church for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and so you know what parents the greatest ministry that we can equip you for is to minister to your kids to minister to the next generation and so you might be saying man my kids are just home all the time and you know they're not here at the church and, and in their programs at the church but we've been providing some resources for you and I just want to encourage you to get a hold of those resources and do some devotions with your kids spend time praying with them and and talking about what's going on in the world and where god is in our lives in the midst of this because we are we are still in the control of god as people that have given the control of our lives over to jesus he's in control he's for us he's not against us and this is a great time for us to be able to impart and to to empower our kids for a victorious life here in this world and so if you haven't taken advantage of those resources how do they find those chris yeah i've been posting them on our church facebook page i also created a clf kids page too that i'll be posting make sure you like that i'll be posting different things throughout the week um sundays or maybe even saturdays get it to you beforehand but um messages directly you know to their age that you can show them on sundays or during the weekend but just excellent resources to keep your kids engaged in the word of god all right, so up next is Pastor Sherry. I did want to let you know that she has an awesome gift for all of us moms, but you know how everything's being delayed a little bit because of COVID. Um, because of that, the gifts haven't all yet arrived, but we'll be uh, letting you know this week when they come in and we'll make it available. So stay tuned this week on our Facebook and uh, just so you know, there's something awesome. Uh, what's that saying? Good things come to those that wait. Yeah. So, Patience is a virtue. Absolutely. So, so it'll be well worth it. Yep. All right. Here's Pastor Sherry. God bless you. Well, let's give a hats off to all the moms today. On a good day, being a mom isn't an easy job. And the last few weeks have shown us that moms are not mere mortals. Some moms are out there working every day doing what's deemed essential jobs. And other moms who work outside the home have brought work home and are doing that and they're assisting kids with e-learning and doing everything in their power to keep the kids from hurting each other. And stay-at-home moms are juggling all of these things and the kids as well. And they truly are stay-at-home moms. They can't go anywhere. Yes, friends, moms are pretty amazing. And today, I want to speak to you moms, really all the women of our church community. And you guys, you can listen in too. But I want to talk to you about being women of influence. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that whole phenomena of social influencers. Social influencers are generally celebrities or sports figures or people who have a knowledge or expertise in a particular subject. And if you can garner a large enough following if you weren't a celebrity prior to social influencing, you are after. Now these people, what they do is they make their presence known on social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook, 
Snapchat, and YouTube. And these people, they plan, they prepare, they publish, and they promote. And in order to build a following, they take pictures and they post often and consistently. And what is it that they post? Well, pretty much anything and everything. Now, when you get big enough, you hire people, many people, to do this for you. Cristiano Ronaldo, a Portuguese soccer player, has a combined following of 406.6 million people. To put that in perspective, if you take all of the people of the United States, women, men, all the children, and a good portion of Canada, that's how many followers he would have. It's pretty amazing. And companies who want a specific social influencer to promote maybe uh, something to eat or drink or wear will pay those social influencers big money and provide products for them free of charge. And when their products are endorsed by a well-known social influencer, they sell out in minutes. It's unbelievable. But that's our world's plan to influence and to promote. But how many of you know that God's plan many times does things differently than the world? He chooses ordinary people, ordinary women whom he promotes to influence and change the world around them. Now, first of all, we have to understand this one important thing. In order to be a woman of influence, you first must be influenced. We can't get the cart before the horse. You have to have yourself a personal encounter with God. You have to recognize your need of a Savior, and that Savior's name is the only name. It's Jesus. This is the basic and bold truth that we have to be born again. We come face to face with Jesus Christ the crucified, and we ask him, what must I do to be saved? What's cool is the contrast of how we were before Christ and how we are now with Christ. It's a stark difference, and aren't we glad? It's darkness versus his glorious light. It's being controlled by selfish ambition being versus being spirit-controlled. It's wanting things of this earth, power, recognition, fame, versus desiring to be like Jesus. It really is. When we have been influenced or being influenced by God, it's that new woman or man that emerges in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that, Therefore, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, that the new creation has come, that the old is gone and the new is here. This encounter or being influenced by Jesus, it's not a one and done thing, but it's a lifelong process. It's because so many of us are slow learners. When we are saved, when we come to relationship with Jesus, we are instantly given right standing with him. We have been justified. It's just as if we've never sinned. But that process of being influenced by Jesus, it's an ongoing thing. And just how does this process continue? Yes, we have the initial encounter with Jesus where our lives are influenced to follow him. But this process, it continues by us doing the basics of God that we find ourselves being influenced by him. Now, as a believer in Jesus, we spend time reading the Bible. It's his instruction manual as well as his love letter to us. Now, I want to read this scripture to you. It's one of my favorites. It's a familiar passage, but I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified Version. It's Hebrews 4.12, and it talks about the 
incredible power of the Word of God. For the Word of God is living, it's active, and it's full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit or the complete of who a person is, and of both joints and marrow, the very deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what the Word of God does and is in our lives. It's operative, it's energizing, and it's effective. The Word of God is a change agent in our lives. And we agree with the psalmist. We raise our hand and say, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. The Word of God will change you. It will make you more like Jesus. Not only will the Word of God influence you, but prayer will also be a big influencer. How many of us understand that we become like those we hang out with? Sure we do. Um, if a friend has a, a unique phrase or a word that they like to use, if we hang out long enough with them, we're going to start saying it. Or if they tell us that a particular brand of shoe is comfortable, and I know for women if it looks cute, we're going to buy it. We, we believe that because we try to help our kids choose good friends. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, that bad company corrupts good morals. So when we hang out with God in prayer, we become more like him. There's this exchange that happens. We offer him our human cares and worries and in return, he somehow gives us faith and courage. We grumble on about wrong treatment or perceived injustices in our lives, and he covers us with his care. And the longer we walk with Jesus, our prayers evolve, don't they? What we ask for and what we tell him about gradually becomes less about me and more about others. And why is that, guys? It's because Jesus is changing us. The whole of who we are is being changed into his image. And I know as one who has walked with Jesus for a long time, when I see myself being changed by either a scripture that I've read or by a prayer time that I've had with Jesus, it is so exciting with to me. And it's because I still have stuff that needs to be changed. The human in me, that carnal part, will sometimes rear its head, and I have to be changed or influenced by Jesus. John chapter 15, it's a wonderful picture of one who is being influenced by Jesus because they are abiding in the vine. They are resting in in the vine. At this point in history, Jesus is trying to get his disciples used to the idea that he is going to be gone, that he is leaving, and that they have to stay connected to him. The first 10 verses of John 15, Jesus asks his disciples to remain in him nine different times. Again, whenever God repeats himself, we need to pay attention. He tells them that if they remain in him, that these things are going to happen, that they're going to bear fruit, that their lives are not going to be in vain, but they are going to influence someone. Secondly, he says that if they remain in him, that they are going to bear much fruit. Now, how many of you, when you plant a tomato plant, don't expect a harvest of one or two, but you want a plant that's just brimming with tomatoes? And that's how we will be if we remain in Jesus, that we will bear much fruit, that we will influence a lot of people. If we remain in him also, he tells us that our prayers are going to be answered. I know I have prayers I want answered. 
And if I remain in him and I remain or I, I allow him to influence me, what I pray about is going to be different and those prayers are going to be answered. And lastly, he says that if you remain in me, that your joy will be full. I like Diet Mountain Dew and I like Fountain Mo Mountain Dew the best. And when I go into a store to get a fountain pop, I put the right amount of ice in, and when I fill it up, I fill it up to the tippy top so that when you put the plastic lid on and you put the straw in, a little, just a teensy bit might seep out at the top. It's going to be full, and I want my joy to the fullest extent, and that will happen when I remain in Jesus. So again, to be an influencer... We need and continue to be influenced by Jesus. And once we've begun that process, then God calls us to be influencers. He doesn't wait till we're perfect because, quite frankly, folks, that's never going to happen. He, but he uses us right where we are so we can influence who we can. It's amazing that new believers can be such important influencers in other people's life. Are they perfect? Far from it. Have they learned everything about Jesus? Oh no, they've got lots more to learn. But what happens is their life is so different from how they were to how they are that their friends and family members have to stop and go, I'm not sure everything that's happened and I certainly don't understand it, but I need to investigate it because the difference is so radical. They are influencers for Jesus. Now, real quickly, because it is a day to celebrate women, I want to look at two women in the Bible who were influencers for God, but in very different ways. We're going to be hanging out in the book of Judges, and particularly chapters 4 or 5. If you have opportunity after today's service, read those chapters and relive what I'm about to tell you. Now, for me, it's always good to have the biblical perspective of what's happening historically during this time. We all know the children of Israel were led out of Egypt by Moses. Um, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Then Joshua led them into the land of promise. They were commanded to conquer the peoples there. And then when they were doing that, they were each of the 12 tribes of Jacob were given specific areas of land that became theirs, and then they were being overseen by judges. What we see is a cycle that happens continually, that when they followed Jehovah, life was good. And when they started to fall away from God and follow false idols, life was bad. So at this point, from the time they had left Egypt to this point, Judges chapter 4, a little over 200 years had transpired. Now, what we see in Judges chapter 4 is that the children of Israel had been delivered over to an evil Canaanite king whose name was Jabin. Jabin had a strong army, and at his disposal, he had over 900 chariots. And the Bible tells us that the captain of the army, Sisera, was a cruel, oppressive man. And that this oppression had been in Israel for over 20 years. At this time, God raised up a judge in Israel whose name was Deborah. She was the ultimate woman of influence. First scripture tells us that she was a wife, so she served at home. We don't know if she was her mom or a mom or not, but we do know that she was a wife. Secondly, she was a prophet, so she served, if you will, in her church community. Thirdly, she was a judge. She served in her uh, community at large. People would come to her to settle disputes. So she was a woman of influence, and she was a triple threat. Now, she had received a word from the Lord for a man named Barak. He was the son of Abinoam, and she called him 
for him to come and to have an audience with her. At that point, when Barak arrived, she told him that by the Lord's command, he was to gather an army of about 10,000 men from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun, and they were to gather at Mount Tabor. Once he did that, once he mustered that army, the Lord was going to be responsible to lure Sisera, who was the captain of the Canaanite troops, and all of his troops and chariots to the Kishon River. And there, at that spot, they were going to be delivered into Barak's hands. Now, I want a little sidebar here, folks. When God asks you to do your part, you need to do it. Because when you do your part, he will do his part. Now, Barak's or excuse me, Barak's response in verse 8 was, if you will go with me, I will go. But Deborah, if you don't go, I'm not going. Now, this was not the response of a great military man. I'm not sure why he responded that way, but perhaps he felt that if the prophetess would accompany him, that the Lord would look down on him in a favorable way. Now, never mind that Deborah had already told him that the Lord was going to deliver the enemy into his hand. Deborah relented and said that she would indeed accompany him, but because he did not immediately obey the Lord's request, that a woman would be the one who would vanquish Sisera, the captain of the enemy army. Just like us as parents, when we ask our children to do something, we want immediate obedience. We would always prefer not to have to repeat the request three or four times until obedience comes, right? So when the Lord asks you to do something, you need to respond to him immediately. So at this point, Barak and Deborah set out to gather the armies and we are introduced to yet another character in this story. It's a man named Heber. He is described as a Kenite. Now, a Kenite was a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law. And historically, the Kenites lived in the very southern part of Israel. Um, if you have opportunity, go to your uh, Bible, flip to the back, and look for a map that outlines and describes where the 12 tribes of, of Jacob settled in the land of Israel. And you will find that the Judah... The tribe of Judah is way down at the south, and that's where Heber's family was. However, Heber decided that he was going to leave his extended family, travel all the way up to the almost the most northern part of Israel to a place named Kadesh, and he was going to settle there. He was as close to the Canaanite as you could possibly live. Now remember, we have a one important thing that I need to tell you about the Kenites. They were metal workers. Um, just like in a lot of families, maybe grandpa uh, learned how to work in metals and then he passed it on to his sons and then to his sons to his sons. So Heber was a metal worker. So he had moved all the way north to be close to the Canaanites because the Canaanite king had 900 chariots. He left his family and he was going to align himself. He had aligned himself with this evil king. So we see the plot is thickening, don't we? Don't you love Bible stories? It's, they're, they're, the history is awesome. So we see Sisera is told of the gathering armies of Barak and the Israelites, and he gathers his armies and their chariots, and they make their way to the Kishon River Valley. Now he knew that as a commander of the armies, in order for his chariots to be a force, they would have to have flat land on which 
to maneuver, okay? Do you, are you getting the picture? And so again, if you look at that map, what you see is you see the Kishon River here, and over to the east is Mount Tabor. So the battle lines are being drawn. The battle lines are being drawn. Up on the mountain, Barak and his troops are waiting for the go sign from God. Um, an, another little sidebar here, Barak's name means thunderbolt, okay? Finally, God gives the go-ahead, and Deborah says, Go, for has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So get this picture in your mind that Barak, the thunderbolt, and his 10,000 soldiers make their way down the mountain, and the narrative in Judges 4 15 says that the Lord routed Sisera and his chariots and army by the sword. <clears throat> the Hebrew word here for routed is the same word that described the confusion that engulfed Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. Remember the children of Israel were walking across the sea the wall of water on both sides so they could go on dry land. They got all the way across, and as soon as Pharaoh's army started getting across the river, the waters engulfed them. There was tremendous confusion. They turned on each other, and all of the armies were killed. The exact kind of thing happened here in Judges chapter 5, which is the chapter right after the battle that Deborah writes a song and she sings this song. And in verses 20 and 21, it is explained that God sent a sudden torrent of rain to flood that Kishon River. And when the river overflowed its banks and went into the surrounding valley, it made it nothing but a quagmire of mud. And Sisera's armies and his chariots were stuck. They became sitting ducks for barracks armies. And the only survivor of that battle of Sisera's army was Sisera. And it's because he fled his post and he fled his chariot. And he survived the battle. Indeed, God had given the victory to Barak, even as it had been prophesied by Deborah. Now, this amazing story doesn't here end here, however. The narrative follows Sisera's flight from the battle. He leaves that area and he makes his way north to a, to a place near Kadesh, and he finds himself at the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber. Ding, 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 ding. A bell should be ringing in your mind. Remember early in the, earlier in this story, in verse 11, we were introduced to Heber, the, Ke, the Kenite. He was the metal worker who had left his extended family in the south, and he had aligned himself with the wicked king Jabin. That's where Sisera ended up. Now, other than being married to Heber, the only other description of Jael was that she was a tent dweller. We find that in Judges 5, verses, verse 24. In other words, she was a stay-at-home wife. Now, contrast Deborah, the woman who seemingly did it all, and Jael, whose resume in human terms was rather short. However, I love that, however, comma, God had big plans for her to make her a woman of influence, just as Deborah was a woman of influence. Cicero was greeted by Jael, and she asked him to come into the tent, telling him, don't worry, you have nothing to be afraid of. And she covered him with some sort of cloak. Now, this is Middle Eastern hospitality at its best. In the Middle East at that time, if there were 
uh, strangers or uh, wanderers that weren't part of the family. They would be invited into the tent. They would be fed. Even if they were fleeing something, they would be given refuge as long as they were in the safety of the tent. And that's exactly what happened here. Sisera found safety in this woman's tent. The battle-worn Sisera asked for some water, and Jael went a step further and gave him some milk. Maybe it was kind of that hot milk before, she, before he went to bed so he could sleep better. He then laid down, and she covered him up. He asked her before he fell asleep if she would stand guard at the tent flap, and if anyone comes looking for him, she was to lie and tell them that no one was there. At that very moment, J.L. had a decision to make. Was she going to stay aligned with her husband, who had chosen the Canaanite king, the Canaanite's riches, the Canaanite's God, over standing with Jehovah? Or was J.L. going to stand for the armies of the living God? Once Sisera was fast asleep, J.L. picked up some items with which she was very familiar, a tent peg and a hammer. For nomadic women like J.L. were responsible for erecting the tents in which all the clan lived. She carefully made her way to the sleeping enemy, and she ended his life by driving the tent peg through his head, pinning him to the ground. Sometime later, Barak, in pursuit of Sisera, passed by the tent, and Jael went out to meet him and said, I will show you the man that you are looking for. Barak went into the tent and found the fugitive dead by the hand of a woman, just as it had been prophesied by another woman. And from that day forward, Israel grew stronger and stronger until Jabin the Canaanite had been subdued and there was peace in the land for 40 years. Remember, they had been oppressed for 20 and now there was going to be peace for 40. That's God's kind of math. Later in Judges chapter 5, Deborah the prophetess waxes eloquent about Jael and said that she was a blessed woman. She was a most blessed woman. She had become a woman of influence. Both of these women were very different than one from one another. J.L. could have easily said that I'm not like Deborah, God. I don't have her skills. I don't have her presence. I don't have her wisdom. And you know what, ladies? Most of us have probably said or at least thought the very same thing when we compare ourselves to someone else. However, God wants you to know this today, dear sisters of mine. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. The level of influence that you have to impact others has very little to do with the value that you assign to what you are doing, but it has everything to do with whose you are. Let me repeat that. That the level of influence that you have to impact others has little to do with the value that you assign to what you are doing, but it has everything to do with whose you are. Ladies, if you belong to God, if you have been influenced and are continuing to be influenced by him, you are of great value to the kingdom. When we understand this truth, and it is truth, then God will make us true influencers for him and his kingdom. Now, in conclusion today, I want to remind all of us that in order to be true women and men of influence, we first must be influenced by God. 
It starts with salvation. Have you met Jesus is the question that I'm asking. Have you confessed your sins to him and asked him to be your savior? Please, please allow him to come into your life and make everything new and start that influencing process. And to those of you who are listening today, if you have already done that, will you join me and continue to embrace the things that keep the process of becoming more like Jesus going? Bible reading, meditating on what you've read and prayer, abiding or resting in Jesus and saying yes to him at every turn. It's not a question of if we will influence other. The question is, will we influence them for Jesus? Let's be women and men of influence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your influence in our life. Thank you for salvation that you give to all men freely, if they but ask. Thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your glorious and marvelous light, that we have been influenced, we have been changed by you. And also, Lord, thank you that you give us the opportunity to influence others. Particularly on this day, you give women to be influencers in their home, over their children, even with their husband, because husbands and wives can influence each other for good and for God. Lord, I pray that as we as women embrace that process, that we will be mighty in the kingdom of God. I pray a blessing over each home, over each listener, that your word would go forth in might and power, and that we, O oh God, would bring many people into your kingdom. Now may the grace and peace of Jesus rest upon each one, and we ask these things in the marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. I trust that your day today will be filled of wonderful things, that you have opportunity to honor your mother, give her a call, and if your mother is gone, perhaps there's someone else that has been a woman of influence of your life, will you take time to contact them today? Again, it's been wonderful to be here, and we can't wait to see you very soon. Thank you.